Uh, I'm going to do something a little different this morning. Uh, one of the things that I'm sure you realize that being a Christian for six decades, there's been times from time to time I've had to revise my views because we're all on learning curves. Uh, this, this whole idea of sanctification is a work in progress, and that includes me too. We're all growing. But throughout the 60 years, there have been times where I've, had, I've learned something which has caused me to revise a previous position. And some, those of you that have been with us for a long time are probably surprised because we come out with a product that changes a view. When we, uh, uh, many, many years ago, we discovered that Luke 21 is not part of the Olivet Discourse. And my earlier tapes, like everybody, they think of the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 and Mark 13, they're identical except for one verse. And Luke 21 is, well, Luke 21 is not the Olivet Discourse, and once you discover that, it opens up a whole bunch of insights. So we went through, and a lot of people were surprised, gee, you changed your position. Gee, I hope so. So one of the things, and the point I want to get across, by the way, each time through my life I've had to revise my view, it's always been in the direction of taking the Word of God more literally than before. Well, you take it literally. Yes, I do. I was on a interview, radio interview situation, and uh, where they were, you know, called in question, and the guy on the other line was was clearly one that was taking issue with some point. And I was I, I was about to respond. I take the Bible literally, but I knew if I said that word, he said, "Well, then you think God has feathers because of Psalm 91." Or so, oh, you know, they go down that silly path. For some reason, maybe it was just fatigue. I said, "I take the Bible seriously." And the guy on the other end of the line got so angry, so frustrated, I knew I hit gold. See, if I say literally, they have their little rebuttal. He didn't know how to deal with that, see. But the point is, I guess, as we study the Bible, in my own experience, it's always been in the direction of taking it even a little more seriously, a little more literally than before. And uh, so, that, uh, so I'm an extremist. Let's just get that up front. That doesn't mean you have to agree with me, but at least you'll know where I'm coming from. And I, the, the topic I thought we... There is so much discussion today about Iran and its emergent nuclear capability, and people are wondering, you hear a lot of talk lately about Ezekiel 38. How many of you have studied Ezekiel 38? Okay. Well, one of the things I want to do this morning is I want to talk a little bit about the Magog invasion. But I want to review it just superficially to suggest an alternative view and there'll be some guests in the back saying, oh my gosh, he's going to change his view. Not exactly, but I want, to, I want us to take a look at something. And it's in the spirit, there may be a surprise emerging on our near horizon that we want to be aware of. So the Magog, and first part of this is a review, in case there's some of you that it's been a while since you've looked at this, Ezekiel 38 and 39. And it's, it's well known for two reasons. The primary reason is the occasion in which God Himself intervenes to quell this ill-fated attempt to invade Israel um, by a, a group of people called Magog and their allies. The fact that God is actually intervening in history is one of the reasons it's so well known, because that hasn't happened yet, it's yet future. And the, the, the allies are listed there by their ancient biblical names, Persia, Cush, Put, Libya, Gomer, Tagarma, Meshach, and Tubal. And uh, the second reason it's so well known among uh, uh, Bible buffs is that it appears to anticipate the use of nuclear weapons. And so for those two reasons, it's much discussed. And we'll take a look at it a little bit. Uh, the word of the Lord came unto me, Ezekiel uh, chapter 38, verse 1. Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog. The chief prince of Beshech and Tubal and prophesy against him, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. Well, the first question here is, who is Magog? And uh, people wonder, why, why, why does the Bible always use these strange names? And the reason, of course, is that we, make, we, we force it to. Because we keep changing the names of things, Right? The place called Petrograd, then it was St. Petersburg, then it was called Leningrad, now it's St. Petersburg again. And my, my friends in Russia remind me that in Russia even the past is uncertain. See? <laughs> so, and so we, we give other examples of that, but the point is, so if you're Isaiah and God calls upon you to talk about the Persian Empire a hundred years before it even exists in history, how do you refer to it? By their ancestors. 
We don't change the names of our ancestors. So they see it speaks of Elam and so forth. Well, Magog, of course, is one of the sons of Japheth. And so fortunately, we have uh, a number of ancient authorities that nail down the identity of what the Bible calls Magog, uh, a Hesiod, a Greek didactic poet that spoke in the 8th century B.C., refers to the descendants of Magog as the Scythians. Okay, so that's an identity. Herodotus, who wrote in the 5th century B.C., who is considered the father of history. That's actually a title that uh, is appended to him. Uh, he speaks also of the Scythians, who apparently dominated the southern steppes of Russia from the 10th century B.C. through about the 3rd century B.C., uh, from the Ukraine all the way to China. So that's the, they were a nomadic group. But Philo, Josephus, and other things also talk about it, and we'll hear, see Russia references to the Great Wall of China, which is known in the ancient texts as the ramparts of Gog and Magog. And the Soviet archaeologists have uncovered frozen graves that were frozen for 2,500 years, so they, they're still material in the digestive tracts. They can, from that, learn a great deal about their lifestyle. And we know a lot about them th- from that. But uh, uh, we'll get, we, I don't want to go, we're not going to try to build the whole case. This should be just by way of review. But the Great Wall of China was built to keep Magog out. And, uh, the, the, so, uh, and Magog, the, the ramparts of Gog and Magog is one of its titles. But the Scythians, and they were repulsed from media, and they settled in the, uh, in the fertile area of the Ukraine, north of the Black Sea. And I won't go through all the other details here. Um, but to give you a rough feeling, they actually, they actually had a country for a while called Scythia, between the Danube and the Dan, uh, uh, and uh, uh, it, it included Kiev, if you will, and uh, just north of the Black Sea, Meshach and Tubal being principal cities on the south coast of the Black Sea. And uh, Georgia lies right in between that, so when you see that in the issues over Georgia, you can begin to realize there's some strategic issues there uh, if you have a southward strategy. But in any case, moving on, the, uh, they swept across uh, uh, that whole area, and again, I'm in the interest of time, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Even the name Caucasus. Most of us on passports say we're Caucasian. Well, that's really, Caucasus itself is a, a name derived from Gog's Fort, by the way. Just a colorful thing for conversation sometime. Let's move on. Um, verse 4, I will, uh, God says, I will turn thee back, put hooks in the jaws. In other words, they're going to be drawn by God himself into this attempt to invade. Uh, I'll bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. And we can go on about that. But you see the word horses. Don't be misled by a, a myopic vocabulary. In other words, we are victims of the translation, okay? The word horses in the Hebrew is sus. It means leaper. It's from the root meaning to skip. The, in, in, in Jeremiah 8, verse 7, it, that word is treated, uh, ter, uh, it translated as a bird. In uh, Exodus, it's tra- uh, the term is used for chariot rider. Uh, the, the Merkava is the term for chariot, and that's the, that's the term for tanks. So do, don't, don't let the vocabulary, don't lock yourself in with a 1611 vocabulary. I'm not going to spend time on this presentation to develop that. Just caution you, if you're going to get into this, get into it seriously. But moving on, it lists then in verse 5, the allies, Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, with all of them having shield and helmet. Persia, of course, we know as uh, Elam, or Iran, today's vocabulary. Ethiopia is not what we think of Ethiopia. It's really, um, they, the, the Kush is the, the term, and it's uh, settled south of the second cataract of Nile. It would include uh, Sudan and other uh, elements. Libya is, is uh, uh, unfortunate translation in the sense that the put is the... Uh, word, they settled west of Egypt, and so we, that's why it's translated Libya, but it's actually what we would call more properly North Africa, not just Libya. But um, the, uh, and Gomer and his bands, uh, the Sumerians, and they settled between the Danube and the Rhine and so forth. Um, and uh, there's plenty of visibility on this in Herodotus, uh, uh, Plutarch, Josephus, they have our, our sources here if you have doubts. In today's world, there's not a lot of debate other than just on some of the details, but Tagarma is uh, uh, still the, the Armenians and uh, uh, the Turkestan and others call themselves the House of Tagarma. And so those are terms maybe foreign, our ear, foreign to our ears, but is uh, common if you study, study in this area. Of the north quarter, now here's something we miss. It's the, actually in the uttermost part of the north. So if you don't know any of these things and you go to a map, put your finger in Israel and just go north to the uttermost part, what do you run into? 
Russia. So uh, you can quibble about some of the subtleties, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, so what, Mag what the passage talks about is a people called Magog and a bunch of allies that are listed by their tribal names that they align themselves to in an attempt to invade Israel. And God is going to intervene and prevent that from happening, in effect. So that's, everybody's sort of expectant about that. But there's some peculiarities about the text that all of us are guilty of glossing over. And I want to touch on some of those and propose an answer to that. In verse 7, God says, Be thou prepared, prepare for thyself, and thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. What this implies is that Magog is not only the leader, but it's, it, makes, it supplies the weapons. And so who is currently providing Persia, Kush, Put, Gomer, and Tagarma their arms? Russia, of course. It depends on that uh, for their economy. Arms and oil exports are, their, are critical to them. Um, it goes on, and may, after many days thou shalt be visited, in the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, that is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which has always been waste, but is brought forth out of the nations, and they, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Hmm, that's an interesting phrase. They shall, Israel dwelling safely? Do you thought there's hundreds of rockets coming in from the south and from the north, from the Hezbollah in the north? I mean, are they dwelling safely? I, I find that a little, that's an uncomfortable fit there. And uh, it certainly has been restored from its de former desolation. That's a great event in our lifetimes from May 14th on. The state is there. But again, we, Ezekiel continues here. God says, Thou shalt ascend and come like a speaking to Magog. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands, and many people with thee. Thus saith the Lord God, It shall come, also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. And thou shalt say... This is God inferring what in the mind of the Magogians, if you will. Thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. Really. I will go to them that are at rest and that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates. Now, over the many years, as I, I got to this verse, I sort of, just sort of, well, sort of, I didn't, wasn't listening. And we're all guilty of that, by the way. That's really when I'm going to get a caution flag here. I'm not here to sell you a view. I'm here to sell you a methodology. Let's let the text talk to us. Let's not impose on the text our preconceived presumptions, right? Unwalled villages, without walls, having neither bars or gates. Well, wait a minute. We know about walls, don't we? China made the, the wall for, in 200 B.C. that's world famous. Berlin Wall, 1961. We're all familiar with that. In Israel today, there's a 430-mile wall 25 feet high. So we can't ignore that as we try to understand what's going on, right? See, that's the role of Issachar, who understood the times and knew what their country had to do. We need to understand the text for lots of reasons, one of which is to try to put in perspective, where are we today? Well, i got a problem with this here, but there's more. Continuing, verse 12 in Ezekiel 38, To take a spoil, to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited, upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods and dwell in the midst of the land. I want you to notice the motivation of Magog and their bands. It's to take spoil. Gold, silver, cattle, and goods are specifically mentioned. It's not a motivation of hatred per se. It's a motivation of greed or spoil. Okay? Take a spoil, to take a prey. That's the point that's going on here in the mind of Magog and the allies. Uh, Sheba and Dedan. Now, that, those are issues for Yemen and Saudi Arabia, basically. Uh, and the, the merchants of Tarshish and all the young lines thereof shall say to thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? See, Sheba and Dedan are, are not participants, nor are they defenders. They're on the sidelines saying, Hey, what are you guys doing? You get the picture? Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey? To gather away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take... There it is again. See, Sheba and Dedan are tribal names that we generally would associate with Yemen and Saudi Arabia. But notice they're spectators, not participants here. Sheba is a, 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 it speaks apparently of the area that we think of as Yemen and Dedan, Saudi Arabia. Um, but to, to come to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, cattle and goods. Keep your eye on that because that, that's going to lead us, I think, to an insight that I'm coming to. Okay. Silver and gold, cattle and goods. Okay. 
And uh, now it mentions Tarshish. A lot of confusion about Tarshish, by the way. Where is Tarshish? And there are a lot of conjectures. Some say Spain, some Sardinia, and even to Britain. What do, we, what do we know about Tarshish? We know from Ezekiel 27 it was a source of tin. That catches our attention because the name Britannia means a source of tin, by the way. And uh, so uh, the Phoenicians, we know, brought tin from Cornwall. That's a matter of archaeological history. Jonah, when God called him to go to Nineveh, tried to go as far as he could the other way. In our common vernacular, he took a ticket to, he took a slow boat to China, you know. I mean, he wanted to get as far away as he could conceive, right, until God explained his call a little more clearly to him, right? <laughs> so he bought a ticket to, the, to that area. He never saw it, of course. Instead, he got a tour of the inside of a big fish, right? But the point is, what were the ships of Tarshish? They're mentioned all through the Scripture. The ships of Tarshish were large merchant vessels that were designed for ocean-going traffic that would take two years or longer. They were a different kind of vessel. That's what the ships of Tarshish came to mean, is a ship, if you signed on there, you expect to be gone for two years. There's evidence of that. So what, what are we talking about here? Uh, and that's what leads us to, to, to suspect we know that there was trade in the Middle East from the British Isles. And so it's not conclusive, but it's not unreasonable to assume that Tarshish was an allusion to the British Isles. But in any case, let's move on. Therefore, Son of Man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it. There's that emphasis again. My people Israel, though. Now here's... If you have a view, as I do have, doesn't mean I'm right, but I have a view that God deals with Israel and the church on a mutually exclusive basis. The fact that God here is overtly, openly dealing with Israel tells me this is probably post-church. This is one of the reasons, not the only reason, but the, probably one of the main reasons, why many scholars, and we're among those, that feel that this is a event, it reverse to an event after the rapture of the church. See, God in the days of Esther and so forth dealt, but invisibly behind the scenes. But dealing overtly is a clue uh, if, if our presumptions that we go are, are correct. And that's why many think this is a post-harpazo, a post-rapture event, if you will. But uh, let's move on here. Thou shalt come from thy place, God speaking to me, God. Thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee all of them riding upon horses, a great company, and a mighty army, and I won't get in the vocabulary thing again, but from the north parts, and that's grammatic, from the grammar in the, he, in the Hebrew, it's the uttermost parts. It's not just from the north, it's from the uttermost parts of the north. Thou shalt come up against my people Israel, a cloud to cover the land, it shall be in the latter days, aha, and I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. I haven't gotten into the identity of Gog it's very strange for a passage in the Scripture to have a major player without any linkages or background set up for that. Who is Gog? Well, it, the, I believe the identity that's hidden behind Amos chapter 7, verse 1, in the Septuagint. It's one of those places the Masoretic text is pretty confusing. So I believe he's a, it's basically a title of a demon king. So it's the leader, obviously, of Magog, but it's, it, we think it's an illusion in, in the demonic sense. But let's move on. Um, anyway, that's, and that explains the mystery of why it can be referred again after the millennium. Because Magog's a people, that can survive the millennium, but how can the leader survive? What's well, the title of the leader? So that's the point. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, verse 17, Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them? And I think that's an allusion to the first verses of Amos 7, and that's a whole other study. It's in our materials on that if you want to get into it, but in the Septuagint is the key to that, I believe. But moving on. It shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come up against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. Now, when you realize who God is, that's a scary. That's as scary as they get for the creator of the universe saying that my fury shall come up against my face. He's upset about it, okay? For in my jealousy, God speaking, in my jealousy... And in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. I shudder when I just read this. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. And that's a global, going to be a global phenomenon we'll pick up in verse 20. 
that the, every being on the planet Earth will feel that shaking. That's a big deal. It's not just a few tremors. And uh, moving on, verse, in fact, verse 20, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the breasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. Wow. I don't think that's happened yet, has it? Not so you'd notice, huh? And the mountains shall be thrown down, and steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. All men are going to explain. Now, by the way, not to get into a classified area, but most of our off-the-shelf weapons are from one to four megatons. We have reason to believe there have been 25 megaton weapons built, and they're too big to be useful. If a few of those were fired at the same time, it would alter the orbit of the Earth. So uh, uh, we're, we're, in a weapons technology sense, in that kind of environment moving forward. In fact, the real pioneering in weapons is to make them smaller and more effective, not bigger and more effective, because they're already too big to be useful. Moving on here, though, verse 21. And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. And that echoes Genesis 16 as a discussion, a, a, a descriptor, as hints at least a description of Ishmael. We don't need to get that here. We're going to get to that in a little different cut here in a minute. And I will uh, plead against him with pestilence, with blood. I will rain upon him and upon his bands, upon the many people that are with him. With what? An overflowing rain. <laughs> now, people who are just watching this on the video or something probably don't realize we're getting quite a rain here in Tennessee this morning. So it, it gives a very colorful effect, but, but that's not what it's talking about because it's not rain, it's hailstones, fire, and brimstone. And that's going to fall not just on Magog and his allies, but on a third party we haven't gotten to yet. Come to that in a little bit, a little bit here. There's a third party in chapter 39, verse 6, we'll, t- we'll touch on here later. But God continues here. He says, Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, that I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Interesting, interesting phrase. In contrast to whom? Allah, perhaps. But we'll move on here. And why do we get the feeling that there's nuclear weapons? To get that, we go through Ezekiel 39. I won't do it in detail. I'll summarize it. The leftover weapons from this involvement will provide all the energy uh, needs of of, uh, the nation Israel for seven years. And if you read the ancient commentators, J.A. Seiss, who wrote in 1860 and others, they say that must be symbolic because nothing can burn that long, and we, we laugh at that today. What weapons technology could easily provide all the energy needs Israel needs for more than seven years? Nuclear, yes. And you can convert weapons grade stuff to reactor quite readily. But the, the Holy Spirit goes on in chapter 39. It implies that professionals are hired to clear the battlefield. In the quaint King James, they sever out men of continual employment. I argue that's a professional. But it goes on further than that. They wait for seven months, and then they clear for seven months. And what do they do with what they find? They bury it east of the Dead Sea. Read that downwind. It goes on. The Holy Spirit goes on and on and on about this. If a traveler finds something the professionals have missed, he doesn't touch it. He marks the location, lets the professionals deal with that. Why does that catch my eye? Well, you guys have been briefed on NBC for nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare. Know the drill. There are procedures for this sort of thing that are well established. That's exactly what they specify, although Ezekiel wrote this 2,550 years ago. So just to recap, okay, we've got these nations coming against Israel, and of course God intervenes. Dedan and Sheba being stand, you know, standing by to, to uh, um, watch it all. But there is a verse 6. I won't get into 39 in detail except to highlight one strange illusion we should be aware of. In th- chapter 39, verse 6, God says, I'll send fire upon, it's a recap thing, I'll send fire upon Magog, right? And among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So there's Israel that they're trying to attack. God defends them and clobbers their invaders with hailstone and fire and all that stuff. Okay, understand that. 
and also some third party. Who is this third party? Don't know. They dwell carelessly in the isles. The word isles there is used to mean co- remote coast. If we look every place it appears, it seems to be a remote coastline or isles, a very pleasant place that's, that's far distant is the, the, the flavor of that word. And among them, a third party, neither, not Magog, not Israel, somebody else. Who are they? We don't know. They dwell carelessly. The word in Hebrew is batash. It means in false confidence. This leads to a conjecture by some that maybe it's the U.S. Maybe it's the U.S. missile. There's a, there's a brinksmanship thing going on. This attack is starting in Israel, and the U.S. says, watch out or else. It's like the 13 days of the Cuban Missile Crisis, except this time somebody on one side of that does something stupid and triggers an exchange. And the speculation is that maybe it's our warheads that become the, what falls on Magog, but Russian missiles, in response, deliver an overdue judgment on the U.S. as a byproduct. Conjecture. We don't know. Let you uh, watch for it and see. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> but let's move on a little bit. Let's just summarize where we are. The Arab-Israeli conflict is obviously in the news every day. The emergence of Iran's nuclear capability is on the threshold of reaching fruition. There's oil discoveries in the Caspian Sea between Russia and Iran that's bringing them closer together. All these would seem to be preparatory steps for the big show forthcoming. That's why so many people are interested in me going. That's why I chose this to, just to recap here, because there's a problem. It's always bothered me. Did you notice that there's no mention of any of Israel's immediate neighbors? What's that mean? Okay. What are the missing nations here? Where are the Lebanese? Where are the Syrians? Where's Iraq? Where are the Jordanians, as we would call them? Where are the Egyptians? See, Egyptian, Egypt's not mentioned in Ezekiel 38. That's a little strange, isn't it? Where are the, where's Saudi Arabia? They apparently on the sidelines some way, not participating. That's hard to understand. Where are the Palestinians? That raises a whole other mystery, by the way. We'll get into that only enough to get you to dig into it a little bit. There's Israel, the Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. None of them mentioned in Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38 deals with the nations that are outside that ring. Is there a prophecy that deals with those neighbors? And surprisingly, there's one that's been widely overlooked. We know the nation's been established as a sovereign state. The nation apparently is supposed to be militarily secure. I don't think they're quite there yet. A nation apparently at peace in the Middle East? I don't think so. A nation of restored material fortunes? One can argue that either way. Let's go back and look at Ezekiel 37 and notice a verse that's also misunderstood, I think. Remember Ezekiel 37? That's the dry bones vision, the, the preceding event prior to 38, obviously. There it says in Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel says, Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say unto the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. He's speaking of the dry bones vision, if you recall. But the next verse is misunderstood by many. Um, So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Now, the word exceeding there is an adverb, not an adjective. Oh, really? Yeah, there's four steps in the dry bones vision. They're scattered. They came together with flesh and skin, representing dead bodies. They came to life. That's in the vision, right? But they became an exceedingly great army. Now, I challenge you to come to your own conclusions. Is the Israeli Defense Force an exceedingly great army. Defensively, yes. Offensively, not so. I don't think. Miod, it's uh, exceedingly, it's an adverb. So I'm going to suggest a possibility for you to explore on your own. Is there a big surprise we've missed? Is there an overlooked event that precedes the ill-fated invasion attempt featured in Ezekiel 38 and 39? Is the day coming... When some leader in Israel says, enough already, it's our place, we'll take care of it. Obama sent Netanyahu in disgrace from the last 
where, 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 where NetNapa would say, hey, we want to build 1,600 apartments in our own capital. It's our capital. You know, I can't summarize that in polite language, but anyway, we're going. <laughs> Is it possible that we'll have a leader, Netanyahu might be the guy, maybe somebody else, that's going to have the backbone to say, it's our country, it's our job to defend our borders, it's our job to establish our land. In the book of Psalms, we're going to explore a Psalm 83. And we're going to try to explore the scenario that's suggested in Psalm 83. It's the, it's the, it's, it's the last of the Asaph Psalms. And it may turn out to be that this is a rather timely psalm. It may surprise you if you're studying, you know, people say, what's your favorite prophetic passages? You know, everybody has their favorite here, there, or wherever. It may shock you to realize as you get comfortable with the book of Psalms to realize there are more prophecies in the Psalms than probably any other book in the Bible. That's where we have a handful of mess- messianic insights that are available nowhere else. In fact, some of the Proverbs are mistranslated. The first four verses of Proverbs 30 is a staggering messianic prophecy by Solomon that most people have missed because of translation problems. But let's not get off the subject. Psalm uh, uh, says off. The psalmist there is calling to God a plea. He says to God, he says, Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace. And be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies, whose enemies? God's enemies. For thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. The psalmist is calling God's attention to something that he feels God should deal with. What's he talking about? Those that hate thee, people that hate God, have gotten organized and they're raising up their head. Okay. Whoever these enemies are, they hate God and they're lifting up their head. They're getting organized. They're getting confederated. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people. Who's thy people? Israel. And consulted to some other group. Consulted against thy hidden ones. Who are these hidden ones? Don't know. The word hidden ones. This is one of those places, by the way, the King James, you know, a lot of people, we stick it because of its majesty and, and for a lot of reasons, not because it's the best translation. It's the one that has, they all have problems. This is in the King James, the problems are well known and well documented. But it's interesting, the quaint language, thy, thou, all that sort of thing, we, some people like to get out from under, don't realize that carries information you don't get in the, in the uh, more familiar forms. Against thy hidden ones. Many of the modern translation just says the hidden ones, or the, they, they, they try to interpret, the, tra- the translators interpret, which is a big mistake, because we're, we're looking for an exegetical accuracy, Let the, leave the exposition to the expositor, not the translation. Anyway, who are the, your, his, hidden ones? The actual Hebrew is against his, God's, hidden treasured ones, is the flavor of that passage. Now, some of you may be aware of the fact that graduates of the Dallas Theological Seminary, which represent, at least in the past has represented a, a, a very strong conservative voice in, in, the, in the exposition, have a dictum that the rapture does not appear, appear in the Old Testament. And I happen to have a different opinion. I think it's hinted at at least four times. And I think this may be one of them that I've missed in the past. Is it possible that there's a hint here that whatever's going on in this psalm, or as a result of the psalm, is a post-rapture event? Is it possible the rapture's taken place, and that's what it's alluding to in terms of God's hidden ones? You can't build a doctrine on this. Don't misunderstand me. It just hints as the possibility. So I leave that with you to ponder. Let's move on. Verse 4 and 5. The psalmist says to God, they, these people that have organized against him, they have said, come, let us cut them off from being a nation. Wow. That the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. Does that sound like a recent headline? For they have consulted together with one consent 
They are confederate against thee, is what the psalmist is calling for. This is the very commitment of Islam, to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. Not go after prey, not just gold, silver, cattle, goods. No, no, no. To wipe them out is the, is the goal of this confederation that the psalmist is calling God's attention to. You with me so far? It gets better. Oh, yeah. Well, that's just a little... You get the flavor here. So he then lists who is, our, who is in the confederation. They're all identified. And guess who they are? They're the, na- the immediate neighbors that we missed in the previous discussion. It starts out with one of the biggest mysteries in the Bible. The Tabernacles of Edom. I've just completed a, business, a, 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 a briefing pack on what I call the enigma of Edom. Most of us have misconceptions about who the Edomites were. Because we know its origin, Esau and Jacob started the Olam Iba, the, the everlasting hatred in the womb. They were fighting before they were born. And that's been continued to the present day. Okay. Well, we're going to talk about a little bit about who the Edomites are. Let's talk the tabernacles of Edom. Who are they? Edom becomes idiomatic for the traditional enemies of Israel. And I'm going to show you why I think the tents of Edom that's talking about here are the Palestinian refugees and the southern Jordanians. I'll show you what I mean by that. Let's go back and look at Edomite history. You all know the story of Esau, and I won't recount all that. I'm assuming you're familiar with how Esau sold his birthright and, and then um, was really upset with his father because he got disenfranchised. And so he deliberately marries into the Ishmaelite clan and his descendants. You can't tell which are Edomites and Ishmaelites because they're commingled. But the point is... Um, they show up in history very conspicuously about the time of the Babylonian captivity. And uh, so uh, what they did, they made a capital of Hebron, which is 19 miles south of Jerusalem. That began their new frontier. And uh, um, when Nebuchadnezzar was taking Judah captive, the Edomites moved in and took over that real estate very conveniently. And so that, that's a part of history we miss unless we've studied carefully the era of the Hasmoneans. I'll come to that in a minute. The migration of, into a place called Idumea. Idumea is just the Greek phrase for what we would call Edomites. And so if you look at it, we're all victims of our Bible maps. East of the Jordan, we have up there Ammon, Moab, and Edom, southeast of the Dead Sea. That's not the way it stayed because east of them were the Nabataeans, they put pressure on the Edomites, and they move westward around the uh, Dead Sea up to Hebron, okay? So they move westward. There's direct passages, to, and the land was historically much more fertile than the way they're used to, so it was a natural draw, if you will. Furthermore, the land bore a family res- a resemblance because Esau, when all said and done, is still in the family with, with uh, uh, Jacob. So, so. So the land was vacated as, as the Jews were being exported into captivity. The Edomites not only cheered the, the, the Babylonians on, that's all in the Scripture, but uh, took over. So this is the kind of maps you typically see, Bashan up in the Galan Heights, and then you have the Amorites, Moab, and Edom. And, uh, and the Nabataeans put pressure on Edom, and they move um, uh, westward and form a country called Idumea meaning it's a Greek term for Edomites. And that's, you find that on Roman maps right up to about the Bar Kokhba revolt, about 140 A.D., if you will. And so the tents of Edom. There's pictures of the tents of Edom today. And we find them all kinds. And uh, there's a picture of the tents of Edom that have 96,000 members in those tents. And that's the Baca Valley. These are the refugee camps. I'm not saying that all Palestinians are Edomites, but I'm saying that among them are the Edomites. We find them two places. The other place you find them is in the leadership, in the leadership. And there's a whole study that I won't get into here, but I'll just point you to Revelation 2.9 and Revelation 3.9. You'll understand why many rabbis refer to the globalists as Edomites. And uh, Jesus himself comments in Revelation 2, 9, in the letter of Smyrna and the letter to uh, Philadelphia, those that say they are Jews and are not, 
but are of the synagogue of Satan. And when the Romans take over, they viewed the Idumean. Oh, in a key piece of history you need to understand. In the uh, Hasmonean period, you know, after uh, Antiochus Epiphanes did his horrible things and they actually got under the Maccabeans, they threw off the yoke of the Greek Empire. There's an era there of Jewish leadership called the Hasmoneans. During that time, under John Hyrcanus, they forced the Edomites to become Jews. We missed that. We all know in Spain and other places where Jews were forced to become Christians under the pressures. Same kind of thing in reverse happened under the Hasmoneans where the Edomites, among them, were forced to become Jews, either be killed or get out of there. And so when the Romans take over, they saw the Edomians as a form of Judaism. They, they acknowledged Shabbat. They, fought, they, fought, they, were, they, they saw that tension as being a family squabble. That's their problem. So when they point leadership, Antipater or the Herods, they were all Edomites. In the Roman mind, they were near Jews. Okay? They were Jews that got along with them to try to subject, to get, you know, you, you get the flavor. So it, when you get to the Bar Kokhba revolt where Hadrian wants to get rid of Israel, you want to name the place after their enemies, the Romans had two choices. The traditional enemy of Israel was the Edomites, but they regard that as a family squabble. So they picked the other choice, which is Philistines, to be the label for the land, Palestina. That's where they make that choice. What happens to the Edomites? They're already in powerful families, and they continue. And that's why many rabbis refer to globalists today as Edomites. Are they really Edomites? Are they... Most of us think of many of those families as Jews. They may not be Jewish. They may actually be Edomites. So there's a whole thing you can get into. I'll leave you to go to that yourself. So after the, we also find after the Tabernacles of Edom, the Ishmaelites, we know who they are, because an, an embittered Esau spitefully marries the daughter of Ishmael named Mahalath, continuing the Olami Ba, the ancient hatred, started in the womb and continues to this day. And it's hardly a front page of your newspaper which doesn't have some appendage that goes back to that same hatred. But um, anyway, uh, the other, then we have Moab. Most of us know who Moab was. He was a descendant of Lot, Palestinian refugees, Central Jordan kind of relationship today. The Hagarenes, who were the descendants of Hagar? Egyptians. Not all Egyptians were Hagarenes, but Hagarenes were Egyptian. Okay. And Gebal. Now, there's two possibilities here. The that uh, the idiom man southeast of the Dead Sea is the probable, probable illusion, but there's two possibilities um, because of the use of that word. In either case, it fits our model, so I won't spend time on this here, but uh, it's probably the uh, fact that it's mentioned between the Hagarenes and Ammon favors them being the idiom man's. Um, but uh, Ammon, of course, is the refugee, what we would consider northern Jordan, and uh, the capital of Jordan is Amman, still carrying on that vestige, if you will. Now, the Amalekites, you're well familiar with, that would be the Arab south of Israel. Remember Agag, the king of uh, Amalek, Amalekites, and that leads to Haman and all of that and so forth. Um, the Philistines are pretty straightforward. We would take that as the Hamas of the Gaza Strip, identity of others. And the inhabitants of Tyre, that would be the Hezbollah and the southern Lebanese. And Asher, of course, is Assyria. And, uh, and not, not distinguishing Assyria and Syria, but it would include... Syria and northern Iraq. And then we have uh, the word hulpen is Old English, of course, for being armed to, okay, is what the word really means. And of course, the children of Lot uh, we've already covered, really. Okay. So that identifies the player. The psalmist is calling on God to understand these people, these seven nations, are allied to destroy, to wipe Israel off the map. So he's pleading to God to do unto them what you did in the past calling on from the book of Judges. It says, do unto them as unto the Midianites, as to Sisera and to Yeban and to the brook of Kison, and, and which perished at Endor, they became as dung for the earth. Those are allusions from the book of Judges. And uh, Midianites, they are the uh, uh, Arabian tribe descended from Midian, the fourth son of Abraham by Keturah. They inhabit principally the desert north uh, of the Arabian Peninsula. And uh, the Sisera to Jabin is, a, again, a, a Judges chapter 4 and 5 allusion. Sisera was the captain of the host of Jabin, and the, the Canaanite king who reigned in Hazor 
It was routed by Barak on the plain of Esalon, killed by Ael, and that's all in the book of Judges 4 and 5, um, which perished at Endor. That's, that's a specific place that we should be familiar with, but that happens to be a place where Saul uh, consulted the witch and all that stuff. But um, here's the summary of it. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zebia, all their princes like Zeba and Zalmunna. What does that mean? Well, Oreb and Zeba were the prince generals of Midian, Zeba and Zalmun were their kings. These were the ones that were wiped out there in, in the, the book of Judges. He's saying, the Psalm saying, God, do to our present enemies what you did back then, okay, to these guys who said, let us take to ourselves the houses of God in possession. They were defeated by Gideon. The men of Ephraim intercepted the Midianites and slew them with great slaughter in Judges 7. And uh, so he then wraps this up here. He says, Oh my God, make them like a wheel as the stubble before the wind, as the fire burneth the wood, as the flame setteth the mountains on fire. So persecute them with thy tempest and make them afraid with thy storm. Fill their faces with shame that they may seek thy name. Seek thy name, O Lord. Gee, what name are they seeking? Somebody else? No. We're gonna... Let them be confounded and troubled forever. Yea, let them be put to shame and perish. Why? That men may know that thou, whose name alone is yod heh or Yehovah, or however you want to pronounce the unpronounceable name, art most high, art most high over all the earth, whose name is Yehovah, or however, in contrast to Allah, because everyone that's listed there are Muslims. How interesting. Is this a timely psalm? Wow. See, apparently the only way the world is going to know that God is God is for him to move in judgment. Now, it's interesting if you study the book of Ezekiel, from chapter 25 through 32 is simply a chronicle of judgment against the nations in the latter days. Ammon, Moab, Edom, Philistia, Tyre, Sidon, and Egypt. They're all listed there, and systematically from chapter 25 through 32, they are clobbered. By the way, the one nation in the Bible that has more judgment pronounced against it than any other is Edom. And Edom is off our radar because we haven't followed where they are. We need to do that. I won't do it here, but make that your own assignment. But the point is, what we do know about these seven, they are all Muslims. How interesting. Well, each Shabbat makes a big point of this and does a good job at it. Okay, so at the present time, we got Israel surrounded by immediate neighbors committing to wipe them off the map. And it's misleading to represent them as Arabs, as the press do. They're not Arabs. They're all kinds, but they are Muslims. And what, I'm go- what I infer from this, that there may be a prerequisite victory to set the stage for Ezekiel 38. What does that mean? That Israel takes on and clobbers these seven, consolidates itself, establishes its borders inconsistent with the Abrahamic covenant, and prospers. Becomes an exceedingly great army, they prosper, and they deal safely, so safely and so prosperous that they attract the outer ring of nations in Ezekiel 38, to come and take spoil. And that's what God doesn't allow, by the way. But you see, what, so I don't think, I don't look for Ezekiel 38 to happen in the next few months. A lot of people are, I don't. This is, and Psalm 83 is one of the reasons. There's a huge thing that's got to happen first. And this huge thing, well, I'll get to that. <laughs> the order of events. What are the order of events? First, Israel's regathered in the land. Old news, we've all studied that. Uh, Ezekiel 37, Isaiah 11, and so on. The ancient cities are rebuilt and inhabited, no surprise. They meet Muslim or Arab, if you call as the media calls it, resistance, and there's lots of passages on that. Israel establishes an army for defense. They've done a pretty good job at that, I think, all in all. The adjacent Muslim nations confederate. You need to understand that confederation is non-trivial, by the way, because the house of Islam is divided into two houses, the Sunnis and the Shiites, and they hate each other almost as much as they hate Israel. So some of the things that are going on are surprising if you really understand the house of Islam. And yet they're 
swallowing those hatreds in the interest of their common enemy, which is Israel, in their mind. Okay, so the Confederacy is committed to the destruction of Israel. That's what Psalm 83 really hammers home. A war starts between that Confederacy and Israel in Jeremiah 49 and other passages. And the title is regained by Israel. Remember Hosea? In Hosea, they are not my people, lo ami, and they are going to be called my people. Now, to me, that suggests that's post-rapture. Ooh. Anyway, Israel decisively defeats that confederacy. Obadiah, a little 21-verse chapter, a book in the Bible, is devoted entirely to the destruction of Edom alone. Ezekiel 25, Jeremiah 49, Isaiah 11, full of these references where Israel decisively clobbers this confederacy. So Israel apparently becomes an exceedingly great army. It takes prisoners of war. Wow. The region is reshaped. That's where Isaiah 17.1 probably fits with the destruction of Damascus and all of that that people always ask about. And Israel expands its borders. And then it does indeed dwell securely in the land. Wow. Wow. And that sets the stage then for Ezekiel 38. So I share this with you, not because it's correct, but it casts a cloud on my previous perspective of Ezekiel 38. What do do I infer? I infer that the whole uh, Psalm 83 thing has to happen before Ezekiel 38 can happen. And as I explore that more and more, I'm drawn to the suspicion that it may be a post-rapture event. Well, if that's true, hallelujah is right, whoops, but be careful. Because you and I have an appointment. Did you know that? It's called the judgment seat of Christ. What's the first thing that happens after the rapture? We're all before the judgment seat. Everyone there is saved. Salvation is not the issue. That was dealt with 2,000 years ago. It's called justification. We're all justified, but we're all in that judgment seat. What's it for? To, me- to measure our fruit bearing. I won't call it works because that gets people confused. The fruit bearing. The stuff we've done, no. The stuff the Holy Spirit's done through us. But we get rewarded if, it's been, if, if, if that's happened, right? And we can make a spectrum. I didn't get into that here. I can't do too much longer. I've got to wrap this up. But, but uh, on the, uh, I think when that's over, there, not everybody's equal. I think there's going to be a great diversity. Some of us are saved, but by the skin of our teeth, as we might say it. Others were faithful, persevered, bore great fruit. And I think there's going to be a spectrum. On the left side of the spectrum, at the end, is what we typically would call carnal Christians. Yeah, they're saved by Christ, indeed, but have they borne any fruit? Not really, not so you could tell. If they were on trial of being a Christian, there's not enough evidence to convict them. You know, thinking you're a Christian because you go to church is as realistic as standing in a garage and thinking you're a car. (laughs) Right? At the right end of that line is a debate brewing, and I cannot find anyone in the publishing world, Christian publishing world, that agrees with me. But I suspect that the bride of Christ and the body of Christ are not synonymous. I suspect that the bride of Christ is a term for the ones at the favorable end of that spectrum. And that's a whole debate, and I'm, I, uh, I, 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 the people that are knowledgeable that I've talked about, they all look back at shock because they think that's, they're, they're committed to this idea that, that those terms are synonymous. I'm suspicious of that. But cutting, setting that all aside, here's the point. Every day that Jesus tarries is a day that you and I can repair our report cards. Am I anxious for the rapture? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I'm carrying just as much debt as you are. Yeah. (laughs) So, I applaud the proximity of the rapture on the one hand. On the other hand, every day I get up is another day See, something else, just to get a little bit off the tack, but I've got to say it. Um, most of you know my background. 
I spent 30 years in the strategic arena, Naval Academy, all of that, etc. Um, since our 50th reunion a couple years ago, my whole perspective has changed. It's been the most painful years of my life, in a sense, because I've had to let go of my deep allegiances. When you grow up in a foreign-born family and being a citizen means a lot and going through the academy and all that, uh, America was in my blood. America stood for freedom, not democracy. That's unstable. I now look at what I used to regard as patriotism as an obsolete form of idol worship. I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I'm a monarchist. And my focus has had to be readjusted in many ways. God doesn't want to be number one on a list of ten. He wants to be number one on a list of one. Yeah, so. so the question is, what do we do? Every day that goes by gives us another opportunity to repair our report card. So what do you do about it? I'm going to put something on the screen that if you accept something I believe, you flunk the course, because I want you to challenge a proposition that I'm going to put on the screen. And if you accept this, you, it's preposterous. If you accept this, you flunk. I want you to challenge this bizarre view that I hold. I believe you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history. Wow. Yes, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. That's a preposterous statement that we're moving into a zone of time which, which the Bible says more than it does about the gospel period. You've got to be kidding. No, I'm not. I'm quite serious. But if you accept that, if you just nod in agreement, uh-uh, you flunk. Why? Because I want you to challenge it. How do you do that? You've got to do two things. First thing, you've got to find out what the Bible says, not what Chuck Missler says. It's too important to delegate to anyone. You've got to find out for yourself what it says. You can't delegate that to others. Now, by the way, you and I live in a world where the Word of God is more available than it's ever been in the history of man. You can reach in to the original languages, Hebrew or Greek, without knowing Hebrew or Greek. You put your little computer cursor on any word, that pops a menu which tells you what the word is, it'll diagram the sentence for you if you like, all of that. And it's free. These advanced information appliances, there are people in this room that have a phone with probably six Bibles in it, the Greek, the Hebrew, and the rest of it. I used to, but I just changed, so I'm still getting up to speed and so forth. The Internet. See, this, the, the software to do what I just said is free. Yes, you can spend hundreds of dollars for some really neat packages, and I do, because I get, first of all, I get them for free, but... The, uh, <laughs> I don't get them all for free, but my point is, you get, you, they're available. The point is, everything I'm talking about, you can get for free yourself. If you haven't discovered eSword, you need to find out about it. If you haven't discovered the Blue Letter Bible on the Internet, you've got a huge... It's all free. So all that's available. But the other thing that we've learned, that's why I did a briefing called the, the, the Once and Future Church. It started in the homes. Everything in the book of Acts happened in homes. It started in homes, it's going to end up in the homes. One reason I believe God has raised up the institute, the Coin Institute, is to train the leadership for the underground church. But we've learned through in the 60 years I've been a Christian, the place I've seen people really grow is in small groups meeting during the week. Groups from 6 to 12, small enough that you can ask questions without embarrassment. Uh, uh, small enough that you know the names of the kids of the people you're praying for. Small enough that they hold you accountable to some degree. So that's that step one. Find out what the Bible says. That's the way to do that. The second thing you've got to do, and don't overlook this one either, find out what's really going on. You won't on the 10 o'clock news because we live in the age of deceit. That's Satan's primary tool. I believe that the United States population had an IQ test and failed. It was called the 2008 elections. <laughs> no, no, and I'm not talking, and I'm not talking about a difference of viewpoint, I'm talking about ignorance. 
People voted for a guy they don't know anything about, they don't know when he was born, they don't know what he did in school, there's none of his grades allowed to be posted. What on earth is going on? Remember Pilate? He challenged you. Pilate said, what is truth? He said it rhetorically, perhaps, but that's our challenge. If you leave this conference without answering these questions, you've wasted your day, probably. What's God calling you to do? Every one of us… How many of you are saved? Why? Why were you saved? Well, to glorify God. Yeah, okay. Specifically, why? God has a purpose for you, and it's distinctively yours alone. Not to be like others. God has a calling for you. The great adventure in life is to discover what it is. I'm going to suggest that every one of us, me included, needs to raise the bar on our personal walk. When a year goes by, we'd like to look back and see some kind of progress that has been made, not just you know, over 10 years, one year experience repeated 10 times. No, 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 that there's growth taking place. Now, how, you, how do you do… What's, what's raising the bar going to include? I don't know. It depends on what your situation is, but I know what it'll include. Commit yourself to a systematic study of the Word of God. Well, I read it every day. That's devotional reading. I'm not talking about that. I mean systematic study. Most of us benefit by doing that in a small group. So either join or start a group. You don't have to be a teacher to start it, to lead a small group. Plenty of materials are in. All you need to do is guide it so someone doesn't dominate a few things, but, but you can lead a Bible study without being a teacher. You don't have to have that burden. There are plenty of re- resources around. But whatever it is that God called you, respond to His calling now. Don't leave this conference without nailing that down in your heart of hearts.